Hello, my name is Elise Val Morbida. I'm really pleased to be here with Coazit as part of their online Italian Australian culture series. We're in lockdown, so let's tell some stories. I'd like to share with you some reflections on the making of migration stories. A bit of background. I grew up in Italian in Australia, but I live in London. I'm mostly a writer. I write fiction and nonfiction, and I've been teaching creative writing for more than 20 years. There are migrants, not just Italian migrants, in all of my books. What is it about migration stories? I guess this leaning is natural given my own origins, but I've come to think that migration is at the heart of all storytelling. The migrant brain is prone to metaphor. Belonging in more than one place and not yet fully belonging anywhere, having distance and perspective, the outsider is perpetually balancing here and there. This is not just a matter of geography. The places can be cultural or emotional. Sometimes they're utterly notional. My most recent novel, The Madonna of the Mountains, is set in rural Veneto, spanning the eras of fascism, world war, reconstruction and emigration from 1923 to 1950. The story starts in the pre-Alps and moves to the plains. It's a work of fiction, but it's also an intensively researched work. I like to think of it as incidental anthropology. I set out to portray in granular detail a way of life that is disappearing if it hasn't disappeared already. In the process, I think I tapped into my own rootstock, perhaps even my DNA. I use this as a prompt in creative writing workshops. It's a really interesting way into migration stories, but it's a useful prompt for all creative writing that goes beyond reflection or description. Folk tales, film scripts, epic poems, memoirs, biographies, novels, any creative work that involves a storyline. At the heart of the tale, there's a protagonist who's distinctive in some way. By the end of the story, a clearly identified challenge is resolved or a transforming journey is completed. What is narrative arc, if not a journey? I'm a double migrant. I'm Italian, my passport is Italian, but I've lived in London more than half my life. One of the many reasons I love London is its easy connection to Italy, which is where I'm from, even though I'm not. I was born and raised in Australia. I believe that's me in the first communion photo. There are other images of this same girl. I think I remember the dress feeling starchy and the veil itchy. The shoes were new and stiff too, but it was exciting, worth going to confession for. The friend by my side is as Irish as I'm Italian. We were born in Australia. Our unsophisticated local school was Catholic. We were taught by nuns and lay teachers. Quite a few of us had migrant parents, Polish, Yugoslav, Lebanese, Italian. My mother made school lunches every day for me, sandwiches that were filled with Italian ingredients like prosciutto and mozzarella. She worried that I'd be tempted to swap my lunch with others. But why would I want an Australian jam sandwich? When my Australian friends invited me for a sleepover, I'd ask them to come to my place instead. The food would be nicer. You can hear it. We referred to Australians as if we were not Australians ourselves. I skipped ropes on bitumen that melted in heat waves. I swam all year in seawater or chlorine water. I can do a really good impression of a kookaburra laugh. I spoke post-colonial English, but somehow I was Italian. People told me that I looked Italian, they still do. My family was from the Veneto, our city was Vicenza, my father had a strong accent, my mother was bilingual. My grandmothers were forever in a foreign country, but in their migrant neighborhoods, they could merrily do mass in Latin, shops in dialect and doctors in Italian. They competed for our affections via gnocchi. Sometimes our Sunday lunches became extended family storytelling sessions that were inevitably metaphoric. This thing stands for that thing. Here and now is not like then and there. 
years later, such stories would make their way into my fiction. At the time of that first communion photograph, multicultural Australia was a policy yet to be properly established. Being Italian was not cool. Some of the Italian kids at school had anglicized surnames and first names like John and Susan. Some of them denied being Italian if anyone asked and they did not learn their parents' language. That would be evidence. When Australians say racist things, I've been told, just say your ancestors invented heated swimming pools. I think this was a reference to ancient Romans, so the notion of ancestry was random at best, but it gave me a verbal force field. Who didn't love a heated swimming pool? Incidentally, do you know where the word jacuzzi comes from? In Luca Vullo's documentary, Dallo Zolfo al Carbone, a Sicilian sulfur miner who emigrated to Belgium in 1946 said, the people who love Italy the most are the ones who have left because they miss it. New Zealand author Kirsty Gunn, who's based in the UK, said on a BBC Radio 4 programme called Adventures in Alienation, once we've left for whatever reason and stayed away, there's no going back. We can only make our way back in words. Or we can make our way back in pictures. This is my friend Augusto. Well, it's his arm. In his middle age, he had his entire arm tattooed with his personal memories of migration from Italy to Australia. The tattooed ship is a carefully researched, accurate representation of the ship he sailed on from Genova. Here's another form of migration story. It took me seven years to research and write. Actually, it took me my whole lifetime. The seed of the Madonna of the Mountains was planted long ago and far away. Growing up Italian in Australia meant growing up with migrant stories. My head was full of people and places that seemed exotic or foreign and yet were utterly familiar, part of me, like my Italian face and my Italian surname. I moved to London as a young adult. On frequent trips to Italy over the decades, I've been making and gathering notes, random personal observations on anything from language to landscape. Sometimes I'd sit with my aunt in her kitchen, scribbling into a notebook as she recounted wartime experiences. She'd be sipping coffee or stewing artichokes or showing me how to make gnocchi. At a certain moment, she'd wipe her hands on her apron, go off to find me an old photo, perhaps a memento. There are other storytellers, not just family and extended family, old friends, neighbors, the strangers I'd meet at a wedding or sagra. Huge crowds seated in vineyards, eating and drinking, talking late into the night. People would come and sit next to me because they'd heard I was a writer and they'd tell me about the remote past. These were people who had survived the 1918 flu epidemic. People who had survived two world wars, country people. They remembered a time without electricity or plumbing, daylight, candlelight, trips to the communal water pump, the well or the river, a time when there was no need for rubbish collectors because there was no rubbish to collect. A time when emigrating to the new world was traveling to another universe. I took notes about anything and everything, courting, conscription, flouting a fascist, went to plant in the moon cycle, not with a specific project in mind, but because I didn't want to forget this richly fascinating, disappearing world. And people liked telling me things, knowing that someone was genuinely interested, and that they would not be forgotten. It was like a haphazard oral history project. I wish now that I had been less random. There are so many stories I didn't hear, so many questions. I didn't ask. This image is from a 1930s school book for children of Italians in foreign countries. Look at the terracotta roofed farmhouse. 
the patchwork of cultivated fields, the campanile and clustered buildings of the town, the ever-present mountains, and the sun. It's the Italy you might imagine, the Italy your parents left behind, almost a dream. For every migrant story of struggle, there's another story of nostalgia. Once my novel was underway, I became disciplined about research. It was easy enough to find out about politicians and campaigns, public figures, mass movements of workers and refugees, the experiences of military men and resistance fighters, the hardware of war, even ordinary men, soldiers, partisans. I found myself thinking that history is written by the victors and the victors are men. But I wanted to write about the life of a woman, not one of Mussolini's lovers, not an aristocrat, not a leader, not a political heroine, an ordinary peasant woman. Finding out about my protagonist's day-to-day -day life was not so easy. I think of Maria Vittoria as a kind of Italian mother courage. She doesn't have the education or the worldliness to analyze ideology. She's pragmatic rather than heroic. And she is of her time. What was important to her? How did she make sense of the violence of her era? How close could she come to self-determination without taking an implausible, redemptive leap into feminism. People like her don't usually write memoirs and they don't feature in history books. At first I was daunted by the lack of research material out there, but I came to see it as an inviting territory, like a landscape of fresh snow. I had a flying start, that Italian childhood in Australia, my haphazard oral history notes in Italy, Cumulatively, this helped me to know a kind of truth, the sort of truth that's hard to find in history books. Soon enough, my research became an obsessive foraging project. I read what I could in Italian, English, and dialect. Cinema was inspiring too. Directly, neorealist films such as Paisan, Bicycle Thieves, or Rome, Open City. And indirectly, I love, for example, the Quattro Volte for its patient, attentive, near documentary gaze. I wanted that sort of intensity as I described my characters doing the washing or slaughtering a pig. I scoured the internet for special interest websites and forums. I visited churches, cemeteries, historic sites, places that are nowhere on a map. I studied ephemera from family hand-me-down trinkets to items for sale online. I traveled deep into eBay and other virtual auction sites. This is a vast resource for researchers. It's visual, verbal, unpredictable, and real. Some of the militaria and other wartime artifacts that appear in my novel are ration coupons, fascist posters, Nazi travel permits, a cloth badge made in Dachau, and a sculpture of Mussolini's head with his profile spun into 360 degrees, all seeing. This original sculpture ended up being mass produced during the fascist era. It's ingenious and hideous at once. The symbolism, a head that sees in all directions, would not be lost on anyone brought up with the notion of an all seeing God. This object had to make its way into my novel. I don't know how many museums I visited in my quest for cultural treasure, maritime and war museums, art museums. I sought out institutions devoted to migration, places such as Coazit's Museo Italiano, the Italian Historical Society Photographic Archive, and Ellis Island's Immigration Museum. I took this photo in New York City's Lower East Side Tenement Museum. Away from the big city museums, I visited folk museums all over Italy, from the Museo degli Antichi Mestieri in Pasubio to the Museo del Tempo Contadino in Ragusa. These are little places with collections of agricultural equipment, 
handmade oilskin umbrellas, crockery and cooking pots, basketware, the tools of agrarian labor. When you see an old handmade sickle in a museum, it's easy to think of it as an object from a long distant past, but I've seen people wielding those tools, hard at work, real work, in real life. I knew as I saw it that this was a disappearing world, but I was desperate to capture some of it in a real way. One Christmas, I discovered Contrada Bariola at Sant'Antonio del Pasubio. It's an old hamlet restored and transformed into a living museum. Here, domestic and public spaces are populated by life-size figures whose faces are actually individually modeled on real local people. They're so convincing, you have to look twice to make sure they're not breathing. The historical details are meticulously authentic. Their professions are of another time, the bird catcher, the vine trainer, veteran soldiers of the Great War. There's a woman at a well, another climbing rough wooden steps to a granary. And here, as you can see, a woman seating at her doorstep, stripping corn cobs. Any one of them could be characters from my novel. I've been foraging with these people. We've picked fragrant acacia blossoms and made fritters with them. We've gathered bruscandoli wild hops, dandelions, tiny alpine strawberries and cyclamens. We've skidded across a winter lake frozen solid. We've picked beans in burning summer heat. We've hiked up the precipitous mountain paths and tunnels engineered by Italian soldiers in 1917 to defend against Austrian invasion. We've walked in the pastures between peaks where alpine cows graze, where wild flowers and herbs grow in fine grass, buttercup, borage, saxifrage, gentian, daisy, crocus. In the clean air, in the high altitude light, everything appears intense and clear edged. I was ecstatic when I found my first porcino. My mushrooming companions, armed with special knives, basket and permit, knew every fungus. This matters. Not all mushrooms make the perfect risotto. Some can kill. The joy of foraging is more than gastronomic indulgence. It's an intimate connection with nature. Se lavora per mangiare e se mangia per lavorare. One works in order to eat and eats in order to work. Food is a recurring theme in my novel. Food is nothing if not landscape. Food is the earth, the details of weather, the rituals of saints' days enmeshed with the seasons, the making and mending of equipment, the tasks of growing, harvesting, cooking, salvaging, conserving. Food is survival through harsh alpine winters. Food is survival in the face of sanctions and world wars. Under Nazi occupation, Italy's northeast was still being devastated long after the liberation of Rome. So food is rationed with coupons. Food is used as torture. Food is hunger. And food is love. Foraged stinging nettles make for a delicious pasta sauce, soup or omelette. As a writer, seeing the landscape with Maria Vittoria's eyes, I don't see scenery, I see work. I see food to forage, medicinal plants, springs and canals for water, small holdings for vines, corn, stone fruit, nut trees and vegetables, and livestock. In the mountains, an icy river at the start of spring marks the end of a snowbound winter, like coming out of lockdown. It's exciting, the sound of rushing water everywhere, the sense of new life and work. In the plains, a ditch is a place to find wildflowers, herbs and frogs, often a line of mulberry trees, the leaves of which are harvested to feed silkworms. There are ditches everywhere in the Veneto region. Fossil, the fictional town in my book, means ditch. It's the kind of name a real town here would have. All these details helped me to shape a narrative world, but they were not enough to make a novel. Intensive research went hand in hand with the slow layering of the creative process. Dreams, daydreams, my own personal experiences, 
characters that appeared out of nowhere, plot lines that emerged from brainstorms, and the endless polishing of language and structure. I did a lot of imagining. I had to. So yes, I researched. Yes, I held the fragments of real people's stories. But the story of Maria Vittoria emerged from somewhere deep inside of me. In 2019, the Madonna of the Mountains won the Victorian Premier's Literary Award for Fiction. It was also shortlisted for the UK's Edward Stanford Award and chosen for the Walter Scott Prize Academy Recommends list. Beyond its first publication by Faber and Faber, the novel has been published in several languages and editions, more than 10 so far, but not in Italian. One Italian publisher said they already have a book on their list written by a migrant author with an Italian background. They couldn't have too many non-Italian authors. A couple of Italian publishers said the novel was too Italian. I thought this was a joke, but it wasn't. I realized that I'm foreign and my novel in Italy would be a work in translation because I wrote it in English. The Madonna of the Mountains is intensely Italian in subject matter and sensibility. I was thinking in Italian and in Veneto all the way through. Most of my research was undertaken in Italian and in Italy. But there's a notion within the wider publishing industry that novels in translation need to take you somewhere else. And this makes sense. An Italian reader of a work in translation expects to be transported to America, say, or Turkey or India, not to Italy where they already are. Even so, I've received emails and messages from Italians all over the world saying that this book speaks to them and they want it in Italian for their cousins to read or for their grandparents to read before they die. I live in hope. I'm curious to know more about the DRD47R gene variant, known unscientifically as the wanderlust gene. The 7R allele is associated with impulsive and exploratory behavior, and it seems to be more prevalent in migratory cultures. I'm also curious to know about the contentious theory of transgenerational trauma. I can't help but wonder what else may be passed on from one generation to another. While researching and writing The Madonna of the Mountains, I sensed that I was tapping into my own rootstock, perhaps even my DNA. Here's an anecdote. Some years ago, I was holidaying with friends in a remote Tasmanian country cottage. The power and the water were cut off for a week. We lived by daylight and candlelight. For heat, we built fires. We stored precious fresh water in buckets and bowls. One night, I sat at the hearth, stirring a risotto in a huge pot over the wood fire. My friend looked at me and said, you're right at home, aren't you? You've done all this before. I replied that I hadn't at all. He said, in another life. I urge you to write your own migration story.